Jamal Watkins, what is the Nibiru? So Nibiru is actually a planet that orbits a brown dwarf star. So Nibiru is talked about. People said, there's no record of Nibiru in any text anywhere. Oh, you didn't read the text. If you get the original version of the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, you'll find that the word Anunnaki is in there. You'll find that the word, the word, the name, or the, the word, the name Anunnaki, the name EGG, and also the name Nibiru as a planet that orbits another star. That star is a brown dwarf. That brown dwarf star has the same mass as our sun, but is far smaller and much more dim. Hence, because of the, the name brown dwarf, it's a, it, you can only see it in two mass infrared mode from the worldwide telescope, but it orbits our sun about every 4,200 years, according to mainstream astronomers, not according to me. It's in the inner Oort cloud area, which means it's part of our solar system, and it orbits our gigantic sun. And Nibiru is a planet that is on a, it's orbiting a star, a star that's on a crazy elliptical um, orbit around our star. And this orbit takes it, like I said, about 4,200 years. And back during the time of the Sumerians, it had a slightly different orbit. The orbit has changed over time very gradually. It used to orbit every 3,600 years, according to them. They called it a shar. Uh, a sh one shar is 3,600 years. And so these beings would uh, count their lifespan by shars because they'd lived so long. So one shar would be one orbit of Nibiru around our star. And some of these beings were living for, you know, 100 shars, 200 shars. The numbers are just, the, the, the time scales are unconceivable in some cases. But you, if you go and look at the, um, the stone tablet at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, it's uh, the Sumerian Kings list, which I've seen it and got pictures of me standing right next to it. It tells you about kings that ruled, ruled for 28,800 years, 14,400 years. I mean, the numbers are just astronomical. That's the time they ruled. That's not how long they lived. Even you find that uh, Thoth, aka Dehudi, Tehudi, Jehudi, whatever you want to call him from Africa, ruled over the land of Kemet for 14,000 years on his own as well. So their lifespans are just absolutely incredible. Lance Benefield, did Enki create humans to be the future of the Anunnaki? Yes, he did. Good question. I can see you kind of almost alluding that you kind of really know the answer, which is great because these people need to know this. So when Enki was genetically modifying the existing hominid DNA, he did something a little extra, which caused him a lot of problem and heartache. He set up our genetic pool and our DNA strand and our RNA to be able to reconnect to higher levels and higher dimensions and one, at a certain point in the future, that human beings could rise above and supersede the levels that the Anunnaki had gotten to themselves, spiritually and technologically. And his brother and Lil found out about this, and they almost went to war over this. They had a, he had a big, big, big problem. He was so distraught and so pissed off that the first chance he got, he decided to try to wipe out the entire civilization of human beings on the planet, hence the Great Flood. Okay, but Enki then again intervened because his half son, who was half human and half Anunnaki, Zuzudra, aka Noah in the Bible, he didn't want him to perish. So he gave him a lifeline, told him what's up, and sent him instructions on how to build a, um, a, a ship. Now, this ship wasn't like the ship in the biblical text because we know that that information was just fabricated. Why do we know this? They found the original record the original Sumerian tablets with the order to build the ship. And it was shaped like a round disc. And no, he didn't collect two animals from all over the world. They didn't have two grasshoppers and two roaches and, and you know, two fleas. <laughs> I mean, come on. Didn't happen like that. That's a, that's a fairy tale that they teach you at Bible study. What did happen, though, he was told to collect animals and samples from his local area where he lived and, uh, and store those on the, um, on the ship. And this around this this disc shape, almost like a UFO shaped uh, ship, but built of wood, and um, it's more like a DNA bank, is what it was. It wasn't anything like what you saw on any TV show or movie or cartoon growing up. There wasn't two lions walking up behind two deer and all this other kind of foolishness. They need to stop teaching that garbage to people. That stuff screwed. That's like teaching Santa Claus and everything else. It's foolishness. But that's what happened. So yeah, he, they created human beings to become higher. Higher, higher than the level of the Anunnaki, 
And the thing that proved this is the, is the incident at, um, at the Tower of Babel when Enlil came back from wherever he went to. He comes back and he see the humans building a tower that rivaled the Anunnaki's tower. And they were putting a Shem on top. A Shem is a rocket ship or a rocket top or something that lifts off the top. Whatever that was, it pissed him off. He destroyed the tower. He changed or confused the language. He made people change their languages by force. And he moved people around the different parts of the planet, probably the leaders of the different areas who had helped to collaborate and spread them out so they couldn't communicate anymore. And because he was like, man, y'all getting too powerful. So, all right. Jacob Green, Billy, do you believe that the pyramids could have been used as weapons by the Anunnaki? Um, I don't think that the pyramids were used as weapons. I believe that the pyramids were a multifunctional stone computers that had several functions. For example, the Great Pyramid at Giza had multiple functions. The first function would be that it was a power generator. It was close to the Nile. The Nile's not there anymore, but back then the Nile ran right up to the pyramid. And we know this for a fact because of geology. And when you look underneath the pyramid, you can see the tubules where the water would flow underneath the, the magnetized uh, crystal granite. When it would flow underneath the magnetized crystal granite, it would create something called physiostatic electricity and positive ions would rise up into the pyramid. And then they would be uh, stepped up going up into the grand gallery with resonating chambers, uh, resonating rods. And then once it got into the king's chamber, it would then be amped up again and shot up through the apex uh, from the capstone, which is missing. And then that would become ambient uh, electricity within the uh, atmosphere that can be picked up by obelisks. So the crystal obelisks were like uh, antenna that would capture this ambient electricity and then transmit it to jet pillars. If you had a jet pillar with you, you can, you can pick up the energy that's in the atmosphere and you can connect the cable to the jet pillar, to a light bulb, to a device. They had electroplating back then. We already know this was we found millions of pieces of electroplated gold. We found the fact that they have etched into the stone that they had light bulbs. We know they had light bulbs because when they did these underground crypts and all these tombs with all the painting in these areas where there's no oxygen, except for what comes in through the opening, there's no way to pivot uh, mirrors to get the light to go in there. There's no soot because they didn't burn torches. So we know that they used light bulbs to do this amazing work. So they had technology, they had electricity and the pyramid was that. Also the pyramid was a communications device, the Great Pyramid. The shafts that come out that point at the different star systems are aligned with Aldebaran, Orion, Sirius, and uh, various other star systems. Well, at certain times of alignments, when those shafts are perfectly aligned with those stars, something incredible happens. Water from underneath the pyramid would flow into the queen's chamber, which used to use a version of electrolysis to extract hydrogen from the oxygen from the uh, from the water from the H2O, and it would then beam hydrogen towards those stars. Why hydrogen? Because we discovered that the best way to communicate if we're trying to communicate with ET is on the hydrogen frequency. And so they would piggyback a message on that hydrogen and shoot it towards those star systems, kind of giving them an update, in my opinion. This is my own hypothesis now as to what's going on down here, where we are, what's, what, how far we've advanced, what we're doing, or whatever. But I believe that's what it was. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's just a couple things, but then also the dimensions of the Great Pyramid gives you so much information about the Earth. You can, based on the dimension of the pyramid, you see that it's 432,000 times the scale of Earth. So if you scaled it up uh, 43,200 times, all of a sudden, you realize that it fits directly inside the sphere of the Earth. It can calculate the distance of the Earth to the moon, the Earth to the sun, the speed of the Earth on its axis, the speed of the Earth around the sun and the speed of the sun around the galactic equator and even the speed of our galaxy amongst the local cluster. That's a lot of calculations built into one, uh, one, one thing, one, one structure. Pretty amazing stuff. By Compendium of the Emerald Tablets by Billy Carson.